confirmed as you wish. Okay. Second. First second. Okay. Okay. We will go ahead with the proponent of the bill first. Uh, I should be relatively loose uh, on, on time limits. I don't expect any filibustering. But if we hit 10 minutes or so, I'm probably going to start saying, hey, we've got to move on. But, uh, but I, I do want people to have a chance to say their, their full thought uh, and not to stop people at a couple minutes. So, so go ahead, and then I'll be jumping in if we start getting any, any obvious time, time issues. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Aaron Dorr. I'm here on behalf of Iowa Gun Owners. You know, this bill gets a lot of talk about how, how big it is or how comprehensive it is. That the reality is that we have two paragraphs of code that are actually changing Iowa law here. Everything else is conforming sections. And those two uh, new paragraphs, the first one is the heart of the bill, constitutional carry law. That's going to be found on the bottom of page two, lines 29 through 35. And as you can see there, all it says in the header is that the availability of a permit to carry weapons is not to be construed as a prohibition on the unlicensed carrying of firearms. And so it only applies to people who are currently allowed to legally possess and carry firearms. In other words, if you want a permit, you can get a permit. And if you don't want a permit, you would not have a need to get a permit. And before I discuss that further, the only other new section, members of the committee, is on page three. And that's going to be found on lines 20 uh, to approximately line 29. What we're doing with this section right here is phasing out Iowa's permit to acquire handguns and replacing that with the carry permit, which is how it works right now for most people. The carry permit does double duty as a purchase permit. And that's what we would do here and phase out the permit to purchase altogether as of July 1st. It also then would, would uh, change the law with regards to personal transactions. So if for, a, for an FFL transaction, uh, a gun store, a gun show, most of your, uh, you know, a pawn shop, those are all governed by federal law with the FFL. <clears throat> None of that's going to change. You'd have to have a permit to carry or any other NICS check to, to complete that transaction. But for private party sales, that would no longer be the case. That is the, the two new paragraphs of the bill. Everything else is conforming code. I want to discuss what the bill does not do, which is almost as important as what the bill would do, uh, as it gets, uh, it gets confusing for some sometimes, uh, one way or the other. Uh, none of the state or federal disqualifiers are removed from this statute. We're not changing the rules on who can or cannot legally own or carry uh, a firearm. And so if somebody is a felon, they still cannot carry or even own a firearm. If you're a fugitive from justice, you cannot carry or own a firearm. If you're an unlawful user of, of uh, controlled substances, you cannot own or carry a firearm. If you've been adjudicated mentally defective, you could not own or carry a firearm. If you're an illegal alien, discharge the military dishonorably, renounce your citizenship, uh, have a domestic violence restraining order or a conviction. In any of those situations, you cannot currently and would still not be able to carry a firearm under a constitutional carry statute. The bill also does not lead to any kind of an increase in violent crime. And I would point out a couple of ways to verify that. The first one is the FBI's Uniform Crime Report. This is pretty much the nation's leading um, place to go for crime stats, crime trends, to see what happens uh, out there. And uh, they have some phenomenal numbers to show that what happens in states that have enacted constitutional carry law. Uh, Alaska, for example, passed it in 2003, and their gun homicide rate declined for the next 10 or 12 years um, straight down. Um, Arizona passed it in 2010. Their gun, homicide rate, their gun homicide rate dropped from 232 to 171 uh, over the next five years. Uh, Wyoming passed the same thing, for example, in 2011. Their gun homicide rate dropped for the next five years as well. Uh, the most recent one I have numbers on is simply going to be West Virginia, which enacted this in 2015, took effect in 2016. So the numbers are too new to have this type of uh, bar graph. But the State Patrol has confirmed no difference in the violent crime rate before or after the enactment uh, of this bill. I think it's pretty safe to say with 14 states already having this law on the books that if there was going to be a problem, if there was going to be some kind of an increase in violent crime, it would have been manifest in the 14 states that already have it, including two contiguous states to Iowa, Missouri and, <clears throat> and South Dakota, which enacted this uh, last month, a couple weeks ago. Um, I think we also heard the same concerns here in Iowa back um, 10 years ago when we passed Shall Issue, that there was going to be an increase in crime, there was going to be all kinds of, of chaos. and that was not the case. I think we also saw the same thing bear fruit with the stand your ground law um, successful push in 2017. You know that we were going to see 
I don't know, duels on Main Street. And these things didn't happen because Iowans who are law-abiding gun owners are reasonable and responsible people. And that's not going to change after the enactment um, of this bill. Um, some make a lot, of no, a lot of mention about the issue of the background check. I want to address that briefly, Mr. Chair, if I have a couple more moments here. You know, the background checks are, are sold as, uh, as a way to stop uh, all violent crime. The sad reality is they've been discredited and disproven as any kind of a way to stop violent crime. Um, just a brief survey of some of the big mass shootings we've heard about over the last 10 years in this country uh, where the shooter had a background check and was not stopped and carrying out a mass, a mass killing. The, the church shooting in Texas in November of 2017 killed 27 people and that individual went through a background check first. Uh, the October 2017 Las Vegas, Nevada shooting, that shooter passed a background check. The Orlando nightclub shooting in uh, 2016, shooter had a background check, three-day waiting period, and had a shell issue permit and wasn't stopped from carrying out this mass attack. The same is the case for Alfornia, the Roseburg, Oregon Community College shooting, Charleston, South Carolina church shooting, uh, both the Fort Hood shootings, the Oak Creek, Wisconsin church shooting, the Washington, D.C. Navy Yard shooting, the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting, and the Tucson, Arizona shooting, which wounded then Congresswoman Giffords. All these shootings were conducted by individuals who had passed a background check first before carrying out these attacks. It's also obvious, uh, important to note rather, that they, that, that only applies to folks who go through that process in the first place. As we know, most criminals simply bypass the law and, uh, and get their firearms a different way. Adam Lanza, who killed 28 people in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012, first killed his own mother and then took her lawfully possessed firearms and obviously bypassed the background check and killed 28 people. Now, closer to home here in Iowa, in a really tr uh, horrific case in November of 2010, we had an individual from Minnesota, Minneapolis uh, metro area, who drove north of the metro, broke into his grandfather's hunting cabin, stole his firearms, drove back down through the night, I gather, into Iowa, came into Algona to the uh, gas station at the four-way corner on the northwest side of town, uh, walked in there and shot and killed the clerk, a mother of 11. Uh, then drove down to Humble and shot and killed the clerk at that gas station as well on the side of the highway. <clears throat> he told law enforcement later on he wanted to make sure they couldn't call him in for stealing alcohol and cigarettes. And it just shows the, the fact that we're not going to stop evil people by, by putting these restrictions in place. It's just been that case uh, very, very apparently. Um, I would simply just close by saying, Mr. Chair, that Iowans have spoken loudly about this over the last couple of election cycles. And with this bill moving in so many states right now, I simply ask on behalf of our members that you would advance the, the bill here today. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I could be able to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.